Hi, LA Progressive friends. Uh, Dick and Sharon back again with our dear friend, Reverend Peter Larman, a retired uh, pastor of many years who now has moved to Providence, Rhode Island, a prolific writer and, a, and an anti-racist activist since way back when. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing fine. On a Sunday when we're recording this, a fine Sunday, I overslept a little bit, so I'm late to the party, but here I am. So you recently wrote an article for us called Campus Neutrality, Not Principle, Just Power. But you, you wanted to start with something you saw in the New York Times today. You want to share what that was? Yeah, I want to begin by saying that um, anti-Semitism is real. Uh, Jew hatred is real. It's uh, uh, the, the oldest, maybe the oldest form and, and ugliest form of bigotry that there is. And so it's a highly, highly charged issue. It always will be. And as as you know, in New York, Columbia University campus is one of hundreds of campuses to be roiled, but really roiled in New York about this uh, with New York's large Jewish population. So the university now has a new president, and there's yet another study of anti-Semitism on that campus that was reported in the New York Times today, um, which detailed a number of incidents but interestingly, the uh, the people conducting the study, who were staff and faculty at Columbia, wouldn't say what their definition of anti-Semitism is. And it seems that they included statements about Zionism under the rubric of anti-Semitism. And it seems to me, and really the point of view of this piece I wrote for LAP, uh, is that that uh, conflation or equation of challenging what the policies of the Israeli state are uh, and anti-Semitism is the root of a lot of our, our problems here. So as long as that's going to be muddied, and in fact, a New Yorker who heads Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, who is a, a Columbia grad, uh, doubts that this is an even-handed study. But there are a lot of these studies showing up now and there are a lot of um, you know articles being written about we absolutely need to control these expressions of concern about Gaza and the and the war uh, because of the of the danger of anti-Semitism. And to my way of thinking, this has created a whole new form. I, I just I use the term McCarthyism on these campuses. Um, and I think it's I think it's kind of deadly, um, and I, I'm I'm a little bit worried about this fall because the students are determined uh, to continue this protest. And how can they not? I mean, what I remember being young, believe it or not, and I remember you're very sensitive, more sensitive probably than when you're older to the sufferings of other people. And um, these these news reports about attacks on humanitarian convoys. Um, uh, uh, attacks on medical workers, attacks on, on journalists. I believe 250 journalists have been attacked in Israel. Um, show the face of something that is unacceptable. It's simply unacceptable. We've discussed this. We've also discussed, going back to anti-Semitism, the fact that um, Christianity, Western Christianity, is significantly responsible for this for this. Uh, poison. But I'm urging my friends uh, who care about free expression, frankly, to stand strong on the fact that critiques of Israel policy, and particularly critiques of U.S. support for these policies, without which they couldn't do it, uh, have to continue and, 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 and can't be cowed by these uh, free-flying accusations of anti-Semitism. Yeah, so as, as uh, publishers and editors of an online social justice magazine that covers these issues, this is this is really important because because uh, you know sophisticated people, I'll call us sophisticated people, know that there is a difference between uh, criticizing Zionist oppression of the Palestinian people from being anti-Semitic. We know that. But it's such an easy trigger for demagogues dem to, to, to rouse up people to say anything, any criticism of anything having to do with Israel means you're a Jew hater. 
when we we know that's not true, but there are a lot of people who read less than we do. And 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 obviously at Columbia, they forced out the president, they forced out the president of several other uh, universities. It, the president of Columbia was a Jewish woman. Uh, and, and now we're coming into a new school year. And, and you know the campuses are going to be a boil with, with pro-Palestinian, anti-oppression uh, demonstrations. But as you pointed out, the, the, the campuses are instituting principles or laws outline, outline that kind of that specific kind of demonstration, but not another kind. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I recall, again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very careful not to judge the present by the past. But I do remember as a undergraduate myself, 50 plus years ago, um, we, uh, you know, we were activated by uh, images we were getting through old-fashioned TV of people being napalmed, children being killed, also the tonnage of bombs dropped on a small country uh, greater than the number of uh, bombs dropped on um, Europe and Japan and all of World War II. Um, and we couldn't be silent about that. And I remember that our administrators didn't like this because it was causing them problems with alumni. You know, they were getting, you know, the seriously, you know, threatening um, uh, reactions from alumni. People were stopping their their giving and so forth. And they didn't buckle. They didn't buckle. I mean, there were certain kinds of uh, behavior that they that they absolutely prohibited. So uh, I remember I was involved in in blocking Marine recruiters on my campus. And, and you know, uh, they were like um, that crossed the line. So I was suspended. I mean, stuff like that, right? I, uh, uh, you know, direct actions of that kind. But as far as speech is concerned, and speech that was, you know, pretty bad in terms of uh, the, the names we used for the likes of Westmoreland and McNamara and so forth, that wasn't um, that wasn't a problem. Uh, I even remember that the president of Yale, Kingman Brewster, back in the day, supported one of these big marches in D.C. I can't remember which one. I think it was the big uh, 1967 one. Publicly supported it. And he took tremendous heat for that. But he said he said people need to speak up. This is you know this is life and death. Um, that's not the atmosphere on campus now. These uh, these administrators are paying way too much attention, I think, to the big donors and the you know the uh, let's say overly sensitive. Uh, parents, not to mention, not to mention the, the McCarthyites in Congress, the Virginia Foxes and Stefanics and so forth, who are, you know, cracking the whip. Um, I did, I made a little list in, in t anticipating our conversation today. And, um, and the list falls under the, the overall category, is it hate speech to say, uh, here are some things that I wrote down. Is it hate, hateful to say, Today, Israel is essentially offering a no-state solution. <laughs> is that a hateful thing to say? Is it, a, is it hate speech to say that cabinet members, Israeli cabinet members, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, advocate extermination, and, and that's what the West Bank settlers are actually starting to do in terms of um, taking everything? Is that hate speech? Is it hate speech to say that um, that the uh, actions detailed by the International Criminal Court and the UN Human Rights Commission and many other observers are in fact war crimes. Is that is that hate speech? Is it is it hate speech to say that the population control measures uh, imposed by Israel on its Arab citizens exactly match this South Africa uh, past control laws? of yesteryear? Um, is it hate speech to, to call for divestment um, and say that uh, divestment is, is in fact an effective means in some cases of making change is, making changes? Um, and then of course, you know, um, when uh, Russians, for example, commit atrocities or when the Chinese put people in prison camps uh, and uh, 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 you know, reduce them to uh, uh, reduce them to starvation in some cases. The world speaks out 
and and why why do we hear uh, at least in at least on the part of U.S. government policy? Why do we hear nothing but silence? That silence speaks uh, lo loudly. I mean, these are some sort of test questions. I think to to put to ourselves. I don't think saying those things is hate speech, but under these new campus rules, on many campuses, it would be considered over the line to 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 offer these uh, suggestions. I know people will push back on this and say it's not that bad, but I've been looking at some of these codes that are coming down and um, yeah, um, it's you, if, if you if you say the word Zionism and in a negative context, you could be in trouble. Marked well, as a hater. So, so related to this is uh, I, as we're working here, we oftentimes have some of the streaming news channels on, and uh, I am uh, re regularly upset by the gaslighting by the mainstream media that will focus intense focus on the hostages. And we just had the horrible news that six of them were killed. It's absolutely horrible, uh, a war crime. I can't imagine if someone my lo I love, my daughter was wrapped up in that. But then there was very little or almost no mention of 40,000 Palestinians at least have been killed. And, and you and others have said it's probably four or five times that many and many more to come. And now polio is taking over. Um, but but I think they are dancing to the same tune as the university presidents are. Uh, it's it's not just can't it's just not school donors that are putting pressure on on the universities. It's the a few billionaires who can really move the needle with the college president. And they've gotten themselves organized. And I make the point in the article that these are the same power brokers uh, who don't want absolutely don't want what they call wokeness on campus, right? Um, they talk about, you know, coddling students of color and, uh, and uh, you know, insulating them from robust discussion of real issues. Um, and this, the, but these same individuals, influential individuals, don't somehow see that if, if they overreact to the sensitivities of some of the Jewish students, which I understand. If they overreact to that, that's another kind of coddling, I would say. You know, uh, you know, the Jewish students tell these different panels on campuses, we feel uncomfortable. We feel uncomfortable. We feel that people are, you know, uh, judging us. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people feel uncomfortable, right? Uh, uh, youth, college-age youth, uh, broadly speaking, tend to be kind of, you know, fragile these days. Uh, and again, I want to go back to the beginning. There is Jew hatred. There have been some pretty nasty anti-Semitic expressions on campus, often not by students, often by, you know, outsiders with an agenda who want to stir things up. That's unacceptable. And it should, and, and, and the administration should react to that. But to sort of, again, shut down the, I mean, I've met some of these students uh, uh, down the street and the town I live in and in other places. And I've, I, I, I've heard very carefully their very measured language. It's incredibly, they, they have a lot of discipline about language in particular because so many of the protesters are themselves Jewish. They're not going to tolerate, you know, the raw anti-Semitism. That's not... Uh, that's not going to happen. Their passion and their tears are coming from fundamentally from the fact that they feel their institutions, along with the American government, are propping up this bloodshed and this uh, essentially state terrorism that Netanyahu is raining down. So you guys probably have noticed that I haven't said anything. You are a rather solemn person today. <laughs> well, one of the reasons I haven't said anything is that these kinds of accusations, um, in my mind, I don't even want to give them a platform. Um, you, Peter, are 
an exceptional person and we love publishing you. But I think that these accusations of being anti-Semitic, for the most part, it's bullshit. And they know it's bullshit. It's in bad faith. They just want to shut people down so that they can continue to do what they're doing, so that they can continue to support Netanyahu's um, basic uh, policy to, to rid Gaza of all Palestinians. So I, I just don't think that they have a legitimate leg to stand on, particularly as you say that such a large swath of the protesters are they themselves Jewish. I, it's not even for me a conversation worth having. Wow. Tell us what you really think, Sharon. It's it just it's, it so pisses me off. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> well, but it but it's an important conversation because it's a force in our world. It's like the the attacks on equality, belonging, and inclusion. Yeah, the BDS is. We need to just call it out as bullshit. It is bullshit. It's, right. It's the same bullshit that was used to protect and keep the institution of slavery going for 300 years and claim that this is a, a democratic society. It's but it's, but it's worth talking about it because the little bit of, of that kind of training we took, I mean, formal training, what is it designed to do? It's designed to raise, really raise the awareness of people who look like me and Peter to, to the various trepidations that people that look like Sharon have suffered on a daily basis and suffer today. And, and why do people, why does the right wing want to remove that? Not because they think they're bad programs, but they think they might succeed. They think some, a certain number of white people might, might be more open, have their eyes more widely open. And it's the same thing with the, 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 the attacks on the pro-Palestinian demonstrator. They, they, they don't want that position to succeed in the way that Peter's anti-war movement ultimately did kind of succeed. So and 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 from the, the professors that we know currently on campus, it, it's a powerful movement. Yeah, and I want to thank you while I have the chance for publishing Steve Rohde's uh, piece. I thought that was really good, uh, you know, coming from you know, uh, a distinguished uh, civil rights lawyer, again, himself Jewish, looking hard at what's going on there. Uh, that was that was a real eye opener. I hope you got a good response to that. Uh, interestingly, and it's not really off topic. Yesterday, I heard an episode of the the show called Code Switch uh, that focused on James Baldwin's journey in regard to Israel. James Baldwin, uh, when he was a young man. Uh, thought this is the idea of a safe home for the Jewish people is a great idea, a place where uh, for once Jew Jews could be in the majority, you know, could uh, live their life uh, unmolested and so forth. And over time, uh, his views changed and they changed dramatically when he was invited by, I believe, the American Jewish Congress to go over there. He was a celebrity um, uh, in the early 60s, and he did. And initially he loved it. And then he looked carefully at the at the sort of social gradations. He saw that the, the European Jews, you know, the, lorded the European it over Jews. the Eastern European uh, and, and Middle Eastern Jews, and everybody lorded it over the uh, Arabs. And he said, you can't walk five feet in uh, Israel without encountering, encountering some kind of uh, border. It's fasc a fascinating episode. I need to, I need to look it up and, uh, and, and, and read this in Baldwin's writing. I, I wasn't aware of his own uh, uh, journey. Um, you know, but for years, Israel uh, invited uh, leaders of color from the United States to go over there and see what a wonderful democracy it was. Um, and I don't think that's happening anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, but it, it speaks to the inevitability of, of these um, hierarchies being established when you don't really fully embrace diversity. If you don't fully embrace diversity at every level, in my mind, what we've seen time after time is that um, in time, there will be extreme inequities, economic, social, and 
at, and at its worst, what we're seeing right now happen in Gaza. Now, I, uh, I've been looking around for, and you may have it, I've been looking around for information on just how deep the uh, U.S. commitment uh, to Israel is. I, I mean, everybody knows that we're in the middle of a, of a, let's call it a regular 10-year aid program, which involves $40 billion in uh, military aid to Israel. That's a lot of money. Um, but I, I think that maybe just scratches the, the surface. And to think about the way in which Netanyahu and his uh, his his league of enablers over there uh, thumb their noses at the United States, you know, um, and nothing nothing is said about that. And so far, there's no evidence that Vice President Harris will will break significantly with this policy at all. Um, I saw a rather savage takedown of. Jeremy Ben Ami. Jeremy Ben Ami is the head of this J Street thing, which supposedly is the you know progressive, more progressive Jewish community, more uh, younger Jews who 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 took credit for the fact that I believe Harris said in her acceptance speech, her heart breaks or something like that for the suffering. He thought that was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. That's not a policy change. Yeah. No. Uh, but now, now, of course, of course. In saying that, I can I can already hear the voices in my ear saying, "So do you want so do you so you want Trump to to be in charge?" You know that 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 trap, which is nothing but a but a trap, another another effort to shut down clear thinking. That's right. That's exactly what it is, and I think that we all have to be very clear that Kamala Harris's ability to enact um, policies that we would like. Her ability to do that is directly related to the kind of support that progressive organizations provide to her and the kind of power that we have and that we all know we don't have. We don't have that power. So regardless of what her personal desires might be, um, I think what we'll see reflected in any administration right now is the desires of the most rich and the most powerful because that's what this country is about. And until we take that down, we're going to continue to see more. Of course, Trump is just the worst, and we want to do everything within our power to make sure that he's never the president again. But short of that, I don't see any major changes in policy in this country, not without radical change. Well, isn't that, again, it's 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 really on us not to buy the, the politics as the spectacle, not to buy politics as essentially, you know, a, a, a reality TV show. Um, I, you know, I think, I think we're in it for, you know, for the long haul um, and it's going to be painful and there is going to be uh, conflict, right? Um, uh, every time I hear a mainstream political person or a corporate person say there's, too much anger on the left. The left is angry. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I went to church today and I heard a friend of mine, we're, we have these summer services. I heard a friend of mine talk about the uh, the uh, uh, speech that uh, Franklin Roosevelt gave, uh, I believe, seven months before his death in January of uh, 1944, in which he said, as soon as this war is over, you could see the end of the war coming. As soon as this war is over, we're going to establish a new Bill of Rights, and nobody is going to be hungry or homeless, and nobody's going to be undereducated, and everybody's going to have health care, and we're, and we're going to do this. And my friend, the, the preacher this morning, said, doesn't it shock you a little bit? That's 80 years ago that, um, that we just let that slip away from us. We let that slip away, and the, you know, the, the, you know, the corporate's, corporate types and the empire had its revenge and uh we found you know new new uh worlds to conquer so to speak and uh yes we did have uh you know a civil rights breakthrough okay but we didn't uh we didn't deal with the structural issues and i looked around the room and i could see people are, are really thinking about that 
Yeah, what happened to that vision? That that commodious vision. Her her closing line was so. Let's swing for the fences. Right? So so I'm always the of the two of us. I'm the guy with the glass half full. And and I think there's a couple things. I think Kamala Harris is less publicly dug into positions than Joe Biden was. I think that if the campuses catch on fire the way they were last spring and overcome these bans and so forth and generate generate enthusiasm among the public. I think it needs to happen. I don't know that I think it will happen. That maybe we could move to to change our United States position on what we're on the aid we're giving to Israel. And if we threaten that, uh the war the the depredations in Gaza would would dry up pretty quickly. Uh, I think Netanyahu would be driven from office. I, I'm, I'm just hoping, you know, I, I don't want us to, to do another 20 years of Afghanistan and Iraq, so, you know, spending billions of dollars that could be spent on education and roads and everything in the world. Uh, but it, it looks like we might be well, unless, unless we unless we can figure out something to do about it. We Americans. Netanyahu, well, that's, that's Netanyahu and, the, and the Israelis need to figure out their own thing. But we we have a responsibility for the tax money we're sending overseas to 2,000 pound bombs and so forth. You know, the, uh, as, you, as both of you were talking, two words popped up in my mind, um, planned obsolescence and planned precarity. And this business of keeping the average American on that hamster wheel um, you know, when I was raised, it didn't require two parents, both parents to work in order to, now it's like both parents working two, drop, two jobs, uh, uh, you know, a, a studio apartment uh, in Southern California, it's, it, it's not unusual to find one that costs $3,000 a month. So this planned precarity, the goal of it is to keep people so engaged in just trying to survive that you can't have these kinds of discussions. You can't put weight, put pressure on your elected official, even pay attention to how your elected official is voting. The average person does not have the time that it requires to understand how their elected officials are representing them. Um, or they would know that they're not representing them. They are representing, they are representing corporations, deep pockets, um, Department of Defense contractors. Yeah, they want those big fat contracts. And so for sure, we're going to have more wars. It's only the people that can change that, but the people are too damn busy just trying to stay alive. Right. On that bright note, uh, Peter. <laughs> I, I think I think actually we should end there because that kind of is our our challenge. Breaking through is our challenge. Um, I I I think um, I think people know in their in their gut that things are disordered. I mean, what I mean by that is ethically disordered. I think they know that. Um, I think they often, you know, express it in weird ways, and 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 people who are isolated, struggling, you know, are hugely susceptible to demagoguery. We know all that kind of stuff. So, to me, it's a both and. Obviously, we have to stop the fascist march. I think I think I think that will happen if we all do our part. But then the question is. Um, Will we say, assuming we get to a certification, will, will we say, okay, you know, back to business as usual? That's 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 going to be our biggest challenge of all. Yes. And I be, I believe these young people probably will, you know, some of them will drop out and so forth. That happens, but I think a good many of them will will be, you know, I call them love revolutionaries into the future. I hope so. I hope so too. Well, thank you, Peter. This is wonderful. We look forward to the, the next time. Me too. Be well. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.